I'm filling in for Fred Pelley, the vice chair and program chair of the uh, Adams chapter. And uh, this is a real privilege to have uh, Dr. Dr. John Van Verhana with us tonight. Uh, uh, Van is a old friend and colleague of mine at the university. And uh, I even, he was even my professor. I took a course in geology uh, a few years ago called uh, the Geology of Our National Parks. And part of that was learning about the geology of the Buffalo River. We did a field trip. We uh, did a canoe trip on the Buffalo. And uh, some of us went into uh, uh, Copperhead? Copperhead, Cave. Copperhead Cave, which was a, I think, uh, <laughs> about mid midnight. And the, uh, the ropes and things were still not organized. And I, had to opt out at that point, being an old guy. So, anyway, anyway, Van is uh, is uh, just to run through a few of his uh, some of his background. I won't go into all of his honors and awards. I stopped counting, um, looking at his public peer-reviewed publications. I stopped counting at fifty, but he. Uh, was 28 years with the U.S. Geological Survey, 23 years as a professor of geosciences at the university. Uh, some of that was together. I mean, that was <laughs> But uh, then uh, part of you know, 10 years of that was a joint appointment at the university and with the US, USGS. He got his PhD in hydrogeology at the University of Missouri. And uh, he's worked closely with many of the organizations in the state. Uh, he is a real expert in karst, and karst is one of the real important things relative to this uh, all farm issue. Uh, it's something that some people probably think on the road, but it's really should be out there in the open, and I think Van's going to talk about that. So he's actually worked with the Division of Agriculture. He's worked with, uh, and most notably, uh, they have set up a, uh, a Stateway experimental watershed over here west of Fayetteville, where they study cars. And uh, he took uh, an Ozark Society group over there and showed us how when you can, you can add dye at one spring uh, a half mile away, it will show up somewhere else, and it was just a really great uh, experiment, and that's what we're, of course, concerned about in the uh, Mount Judy area. So, uh, without uh, further ado, I will introduce uh, Professor Ben Rahana. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful, lovely spot in northern Arkansas. It had a river that ran through it. It was hilly, forested, beautiful, and fairly pristine. Just a glorious spot. But it was also the target of some big hog farms, pig farms in the area. Uh, they felt that it was an ideal spot. And the result, uh, they, they moved into the area. It was not well advertised. Some thought it was below the, the radar of uh, the National Park Service, some of the other state agencies. And there was, there were concerns. The public uh, raised a hue and cry. Uh, some of the newspaper articles reported the elements of this. But the fact of the matter is, is this is a highly contentious issue. And I want to talk about, for the next few minutes, the people who have volunteered to make this, to collect data. Many of the emotions that we're feeling are, uh, people feel they're very real. Whether you are a farmer, whether you are with the Farm Bureau, whether you are a uh, a tree hugger, whether you're an environmentalist, it doesn't matter. 
everybody firmly believes that those are <coughs> their particular site. Is I mean, it's right. And these individuals have volunteered. Uh, the first group of landowners and family farmers have allowed us to measure, to sample their wells, their springs, look at their land, to evaluate the degree of interaction between surface water and groundwater, so that we can assess, is this really a problem? Are, are we being, are we overreacting? Is there an overreaction in some way? And then there are a variety of people who are very, very active, and these are students for the most part. Victor and Amy uh, went out. Joanne is uh, uh, one of the, the leaders of the Environmental Dynamics Program, and she uh, handles a lot, of, uh, a lot of practical components. Geoscience students, Tyler, Sarah, and here you'll see their pictures uh, in a variety of methods, sampling, taking information, collecting data, because it's the data that's going to allow us to, to answer real questions associated with what is actually going on. Two other people are uh, integral to this study. Uh, Joe Nix, who was back in the back, and Joe, if you'll raise your hand, please. I know just when they turn the light out. <laughs> Volunteered, and, and he. This is this is a man who has done tremendous things within the state, and his lab. He has made his laboratory available to to run these samples at no charge for us. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And uh, as equally important, certainly more important than any role that I had, Carol Bidding. And Carol, if you'll raise your hand, I've got it there. You. Can, Is able to talk to the landowners. Many of the, the stories that we're getting are uh, this is this is as much a human problem as it is a science problem. Uh, the local farmers are related to many of the people who are associated with CNH hog farms, and she has been able to talk to them. Many are as concerned as anybody here in this room, as anybody in this audience. Uh, there has been, at different times, there are people who can bully, they can be intimidated, and so forth. I think, though, because of Carol, we have gotten on to all, except I said one, there are two sites. We actually have not gotten on to the, the farm itself yet. <coughs> okay, C cut those lights now, and people right. can start to nap. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, these are the objectives of the talk. I want to talk a little bit about what karst is. I want to talk a little bit about the general geology. And because the general geology, it's not known by everybody, but it plays a big role in creating the cracks, the fractures, the uplifted area, so that we have steep gradients and water can flow relatively quickly. And these, this is, hopefully you'll bear with me, if you understand all of these terms, you, you will get. This is the hydrologic cycle. This is an introductory term that concerns the solar radiation, the sun, heating up water, and driving this continuous cycle. It evaporates, it changes from a liquid to a gas, it gets blown around in the atmosphere, uh, when it falls, some of it stays as snow, some runs off. We're going to talk about that portion over here that actually infiltrates into the ground. And the infiltration is nothing more than soaking into the ground. If it's a slow, steady rain, we can get most of it going into the ground and recharging the 
aquifers, the, the rocks, the soil. Uh, if it runs off, if it falls fast, it can't get in very easily, and it runs off on the surface. But this is a basic concern, and we'll come back to the hydrologic cycle later. How does it get into the rocks? How does it get into the soil? In some cases, it gets in where there's <coughs> clay that has been washed in. These are fractures. Uh, these are uh, very typical in limestone as a brittle rock. When it has been uplifted, it cracks. And these cracks generally are relatively straight. <coughs> and uh, this is one of the means. Some of them are not filled with clay. Some are wide open. Uh, this is from uh, Art Palmer, who was a superb uh, karst scientist in southern Indiana. Uh, but just a few examples. These are locations that allow you to see what the rocks look like. How open are these? How are they able to transmit water? Some of them, this is Spanker Creek up in Benton County, but there's a fault that runs right along here. And Spanker Creek at this particular location uh, is flowing. Here it's not. It's going into the ground. If it has a huge drain, it exceeds the ability of the underground to transmit that water and it uh, uh, it'll actually flow in this channel. That's a nice channel. Uh, but the fact of the matter is much of this in karstified area the water goes underground, it pops back up, it moves laterally, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those elements. Uh, this is a site, the same rock formation. Uh, this is, is close to the town of Nixa. Uh, and there was a leak in the man's water pipe. And over time, they didn't realize it. He didn't know there was a sinkhole. He went out on Sunday to get his newspaper, walked back in, the door slammed. He heard a noise, and he went out to his garage, and he looked down. These are potential things that can happen. They are not atypical, but they, they happen more regularly and more commonly in, in, in an area, in a crushed area, that could underlie some of the potential areas that are going to receive the hog waste. So we've got to be able to separate some of this information out. Some major karst concepts. This is all I know about karst in reality. Water flows downhill. That's one thing. Two, it follows the path of least resistance. I'm a little bit lazy and I follow the path of least resistance sometimes so I can remember that easily. Typically, the velocities of water that move in the subsurface are very, very quick. There are some other components that are slower, but it's this fast flow that conveys, that transports potential contaminants relatively quickly. And the other term, no attenuation of contaminants, means because it's flowing in big open voids, pipes, subsurface openings, uh, it, it doesn't have a chance to interact and react to be filtered in any way. It's not slowed down. So if contaminations get in, uh, they move through the system relatively quickly. Now there are some components. Some components get, if they, have, if they are attached to clay particles, then those will drop out and those will have a much slower, a much longer duration. But what's it look like? Let's slice it away in a, in, a, in a nice quarry. This is in from Tennessee, but the water follows the path of least resistance down to this <coughs> zone that's fairly low permeability, and it flows outward, and it escapes. In this particular case, this is a spring. This is a spring just north of, uh, very close to the town of um, Johnson. By the interstate, this is a concrete ditch that was put in, and we have been able to do some work in the area, and the water from a landfill, and how do we know there's a landfill there? Uh, we've seen it, measured it, defined it, and we put dye in, and the dye from the landfill comes out here. This is a natural emanation from that landfill, but this is just a joint in the concrete. It's a 
fracture, it's a crack. It's easier for the water to get up, the water level. Here's the next crack up, but this is a slope. So the water level is somewhere in here, and it comes out. It, it's relatively easy. It's not rocket science to understand these, uh, the, the physics and the chemistry of the water. A couple of terms, porosity and permeability. Porosity is the ability to store water. The rock itself, if you, if you canoe on the buffalo, let's go canoeing. Uh, Grant, let's go canoeing tomorrow on the buffalo upstream. I'm free. <laughs> There's no water though. <laughs> There's no water there. It's all escaped. It gets out very, very quickly in a karst aquifer. It doesn't have long-term storage and it gets out. And permeability in most karst aquifers is remarkably high and it does get out. Here are some bedding plane anastomoses. This is, a, I'm going to give you some, only a few 50 cent terms. But uh, it's a break. The water moves down and it's, it's lateral. It, it has dissolved. The, the rock itself gets dissolved by the water that moves through it. The water has a little acidity. It exchanges that. It carries it away. And in this particular case, that's one, that's a scale that shows the, the actual component of movement. Here is a much larger scale. Uh, this is Blanchard Springs. Uh, over uh, in uh, east, uh, um, east central Tennessee, east north central Tennessee, and this shows the volumes when these are these are flowing. These can transmit huge quantities of water. But just an example. We have a very large uh, area of karst, and the area of karst, for your information, essentially is from this region: the pinks, the uh, the grays. Um, but what I want to show you now is plate tectonics. As a geologist, I want to show you that I understand. This is something that's hard to see. Plate tectonics means that these continents, these thick masses of rock, are moving relative to one another. They move at the rate of two centimeters a year, four centimeters per year, ten centimeters a year, but they move, and when they push together, they make mountain ranges. You're putting a lot more material into the same space, and some of it goes down, but a lot of it goes up. And what we see here uh, for Arkansas, uh, about 330 million years ago, plus or minus an epsilon, uh, this region, the Washtaws, from the south, a continent came in, part of what's now Argentina, and this came in, it pushed up, and it pushed against the rocks that are there, this area of the Ozarks, and the result was that it uplifted and fractured the zone of the region that we, where we are around the Buffalo National River. That is why the Buffalo is, has got some of that glorious topography, those beautiful hills that are carved, the beautiful bluffs that are carved. That's in general the reason. That happened a long time ago. But the fact of the matter is uh, uh, it can be explained. So let's talk about now we, a little bit of karst, a little bit of, of plate tectonics. The gradient defines, a gradient is defined as the distance and elevation that a stream or a landform changes over a lateral distance, a horizontal distance. And it's generally high in this region. That means there's a lot of driving influence associated with that. Uh, it's fractured. I, I told you it was uplifted. The caves over there, you've got to vertically climb down. You have to climb down 60 feet, 80 feet, more than 100 feet in some cases to get down to zones that in Benton County or in Washington County, you can walk in a horizontal way. Um, it has a very well developed karst. It has been exposed for a long time, and the water and the rock itself, uh, surface and groundwater interchange completely. And there is a very high degree of that interaction then. 
Uh, this uh, is an, an element. This is just to define. These are the, are the orientation of the brakes and the people. Uh, 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 Angela Chandler and Scott Osbrook mapped this, and they mapped these locations. But the stream segments tend to follow these. Cave maps show orientations that follow these. Those are the brakes, and. Typically, there's a set here that, that is about 45 degrees, and very close to 90 degrees, there is another set. We don't have time to explain a lot of those, but typically, they're in two sets, and they're at right angles to one another. Well, let's look at the second objective, then, uh, and that's to provide some examples of the volunteers, what the volunteers have, have been doing, what they have found, and hopefully uh, enlighten you. And to do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the problems are. First of all, to have a CAFO, a concentrated animal feeding operation, we've got to put a lot of animals in a very small place. Uh, it works economically. It is a good thing in terms of the price of the product that we pay for the product. However, high animal density equals a lot of waste. The waste is going to be the focus of most of the water quality study we're doing. Typically, um, if we, they want to spray the waste uh, on the fields in, the, in that basin. The fields are underlain by karst rock, so there's a very good chance that there will be leakage into that zone. And the soil itself is pretty much, uh, it's close to saturated now with some of the, the potential substances that are, that are there. Uh, that are uh, nutrients, that's what I'm talking about, nitrate, phosphate. Our environmental fears, yours, mine, they're tied <laughs> to emotions. The thought. Uh, we need to get beyond that emotion. We need to get beyond the human component of that. We need to get facts. The same for the business decisions. They're usually based strictly on money. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, people have to make a living. But they have some of the same fears. I mean, if, if we do this, uh, they're going to shut us down. I mean, you're talking about loans that are millions of dollars now. So these are not trivial questions nor are they, is, is one group completely right or one group completely wrong. This is my first uh, take home message and I'll repeat it again and it's, I, it sounds as if I'm preaching, but I taught a class called environmental justice and the features that I saw over and over again, we need to share that information. We need to sit around the table and everybody needs to talk about what's going on. And initially it may be rancorous. You may be, these may be people you perceive as your bitter enemy. It may be Elsbub incarnate. But in fact, uh, it is, without this, we don't get anywhere. And we've got to communicate respectfully but we also have to make sure that if we get distracted, if people are throwing out a lot of things that are not true or misrepresentative and they can't prove them, then we need to stop that. If they're lying, we need to call them liars. And that includes any side of the matter. Uh, here are some different points of view. ADEQ, our environmental agency for the state of Arkansas, supposedly granted this permit under the radar. Theoretically, or supposedly, reportedly, the director had, didn't even know it was it, it had happened until it happened. Uh, the hog farm will hurt the perception of the Buffalo National River. Well, if I'm coming from Kansas or Minnesota, I don't want to go down to a smelly location. I don't want to go swimming or canoeing or tump my canoe in water that is tainted by pigs. Uh, so yeah, it could do that. Those are different points of view. Uh, degradation, health, 
aesthetics, odors, all of those things are right. Tom Vilsack was here just about the time that the, the initial uh, trauma erupted, and he's the director of the Department of Agriculture, or yeah, Department of Agriculture Secretary, and he said, uh, this is, uh, it meets the requirements, there's nothing I can do there. And, and in fact, with, those are questions that may come about later, but I, I think that's important. The Farm Bureau says, leave the poor farmers alone. They need a freedom to farm. That is not, a, I mean, they have a tremendous rules that many groups have to uh, regard, respect, honor. But in fact, uh, the Farm Bureau is also uh, a little pushy. Uh, the owners, it's a multi-generational farm. They've had, five, I think, five generations of these, well-managed, and they followed all the rules. Well, we'll talk about some of these. Right? And here's me. I contend that everything we do comes at a cost now. We are in a highly populated world. This world has got seven billion people now. And if you fly over the U.S., you see, oh, there's so much space left. But the fact of the matter is, the really good space is not left. And the fact of the matter is, is uh, I think we are uh, at a level that we are not uh, sustainable. Uh, pork products, name a pork product, and uh, I, I can't claim that I don't like it, that I haven't eaten it, that I love it. I love ham, I love bacon, I love pork chops, I love pork any number of things like uh, Bubba, uh, Bubba Gump. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, uh, that's it. The hydrogeology is risky. And is it possible to get justice then out of this case? Well, my volunteer, those volunteers, your volunteers, have been collecting data. And I contend they, they can. Uh, this is what the Pew Commission says about uh, industrial farms. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, beef or uh, question as business, <coughs> economic values, and the speed of production it, it makes it better. We get the product less expensively. It is a good deal for us as consumers. Uh, one of the other elements, uh, overuse of antibiotics, uh, a combination of things I'm not going to deal with here tonight. The, the one we are is a contamination uh, with the waste itself, the one that's highlighted in red. But there are other concerns, animal welfare project, uh, problems, uh, changing the social economy, the structure, and the, the economics. Many of these <coughs> uh, factory farms uh, in, in the U.S. and in various states, especially the northern Midwest, have evolved from, they have evolved from, uh, generally they're, they're uh, on the order of about a quarter uh, to a tenth family farms now that have been taken over by a, a production farm. They just can't compete economically. Uh, and there are other elements that allow that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, here's what one looks. Here's what a farm. Uh, this, I took this out of a, a book. This is not from the site yet, and I believe they have maybe 800 pigs on site now. I believe it. there may be more now. But in any case, they are confined. They don't move very much. They have to be treated. There are all kinds of potential security risks. They have to. Uh, illness and so forth, but uh, this is what it looks like, but we're interested in the gas, the smell of the hogs, the liquid, uh, the urine and other components that strains down through uh, plants on the floor and it's moved out, it's washed out on a daily basis and it's moved into reservoirs and from that reservoir they're going to pump and spray the fields, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. And uh, in any case, they can be easily moved around. And then there are the solids. The solids are the, the actual uh, 
solve <laughs> My vocabulary, once in a while, you will see me scramble for a word. Uh, this is the way. This is the way in to the uh, to Cargill. Uh, it's a pretty area. It's, uh, it doesn't look too contaminated to me. It looks pretty nice. But in fact, uh, because of security, because of the health attributes, uh, this uh, I have not. I have not been on the property itself, so that is a piece of information you need to consider. You need to be skeptical of some of the things that I say. So here are the benefits of uh, <coughs> capos. Uh, concentrated, give us lower prices. Uh, and what we don't think about is the nutrients themselves, the waste, the pig waste, is a wonderful, uh, it's just a, a wonderful fertilizer. It turns the grass green, and if you spray your, your fields, they're gonna look as green and as glorious as some of these. So the fact of the matter is, there are there benefits? You betcha there are. What are the risks? Uh, this is from the Pew uh, uh, report. I'm only gonna talk again about these that are tied here, but, um, if we look at that, uh, we're going to change our, our method of thinking. And one of the things I want to talk about sampling the waste <coughs> and the timing we sample. If we sample at low flow, this is low flow. Uh, this is the Buffalo River. This is Big Creek. This is where they meet. And under, uh, we, we were lucky enough to have a storm this summer. We had uh, almost three inches of rain, and this is the same shot. Uh, so it picks up a lot of, a, a lot of sediment, a lot of clay, a lot of soil, but it also flushes things through very quickly. So those are things to think about. Uh, this picture is one that uh, I took a long time ago, but th this is from uh, uh, one of the waste lagoons, and uh, if you have a sinkhole that forms, uh, it, will, it shows you the ability for this to move out of the confined area. Perhaps you say, well, that's not too common. This is another area that can, in fact, create, this is a, this is an asphalt plug, a layer that separates, but the evolution of the caves, the dissolved material, the voids underneath, can't support the weight. If you add much water to the ponds, it will blow those clay plugs out. It will blow plugs of, of all kinds of things out. And the, the fact of the matter is then uh, you have a major type of problem if that's what you actually uh, uh, has occurred. Uh, this is from a, a Texas example. Well, let's start at this, and, and I'm going to uh, do this quickly because I don't want to take up all of your time. Uh, here's the, um, this is the location of the hog farm. Here is Mount Judy. And uh, the arrow points to the hog farm. The second arrow po points to this is the boundary of the Buffalo National River. Uh, so, and that's on the order of about four and a half to five miles away. And here's the confluence where we saw the two streams, low flow and very high flow flood conditions earlier. Um, Let's look at the geology. What does the geology show us? This map uh, allows us to see, it's essentially layer cake of sedimentary rocks. And <coughs> these are the high hills of the region. Sam's Throne is down here. I don't know if some of you are climbers. Uh, and the basin itself curls around here. We take, we draw the highland area. but. Most of the concern, or our concern, and let's look a little closer still, there's the, the, the site, uh, and let's put the uh, site on. 
Uh, we have springs along here, we've got springs downstream. Some of the springs occur, they are actually in the middle of the stream itself. It's not flowing, so we can see them when it's flowing. We have to utilize, we have to map them with, uh, with a variety of means, usually uh, temperature. Uh, but down the river, there's an interaction. So let's go further still. Here's the stratigraphy. We're interested in this unit that's called the Boone Formation. It's a limestone with chert, with um, the chert itself, uh, chert's flint, in arrowhead material. And it is, uh, in some cases, it's thick. It can perch the water. It can divert it laterally. Uh, there are some other limestones in the region, but they are not necessarily big players in this question. Here's a cross-section, a slice, and here's the boom formation. Uh, over in, in di excuse me, different parts of the valley, uh, they, it's essentially flat line, and water typically doesn't move from one valley to the other, although it can along poles. These are fields, these are images that show where they plan to spread the pig manure. And uh, these are the things I want to show. These are from two sources, uh, from the Buffalo River Alliance primarily, but also I got some of these came through ADEQ. Uh, this is, I want to show you that uh, greenish rotating ellipse, and it's got, but that's a school. And when they spray here, they're going to be spraying up to uh, less than a tenth of a mile from the school. There are already odor problems that are present. There are some people that claim that they, again, it make, it's, it's bad enough to make them gay. But these are practical questions that we need to balance uh, the thought of. And uh, these also show uh, the, for the fields themselves, there has been some amendment addition of poultry litter, some other features, some other, uh, oh, I can't remember what the heck the word is, but anyway, it's, it's like a, a nutrient to the soil, and uh, uh, they generally are on, in this upper range, but these that are somewhat limited, most can only take a very small amount of fossils. Itself, this comes from another area. They haven't started doing it yet. I think realistically that it's going to be a real challenge. I think that the Department of Agriculture and uh, uh, the various studies that are ongoing uh, that the, the governor put the money in for are going to indicate, at least from, from a preliminary standpoint, it looks like they can't take much and they will likely have to transport the waste out of this basin now. Those are speculations, though, and, and I don't have hard, hard data right now. Uh, potential for flooding. What if that creek rises and it gets into some of these areas where there is there, uh, the reservoirs are on the surface and so forth? Uh, here's an area, the browns are, there's no problem, and uh, the blues, the light blues are uh, uh, occasionally flooded and the reds and there's hardly I don't see any good reds there so it's not frequently flooded but if it floods many problems that we have from other contamination exercises at, at locations are those are major uh, again uh, when the flow is up it's hauling these streams are beautiful they have steep gradients and they can erode and they can carry a tremendous mass of material. <coughs> what happens when they go dry? Well, they, the water itself sort of pools and then it evaporates and it leaves a white crust on some of this. Some of these smell like the inside of a poultry house. I'm not exaggerating when we were there at first. Here's another example. Uh, this, the evaporite is taken by evaporating and the water's carrying substances and when you're carrying that, those kinds of substances, if it evaporates and leaves it on the rock, 
it's going to move further down, but it gives you a sense that this is an, an environment that is not perfectly pristine and it does not have the full suite of the full capability to accept all of the additional waste. I want to show you just a few of the springs. We found the Elm Springs in Newton County. It's a big spring. It's located just gorgeous. Uh, the water quality is typically very good. Um, uh, here in Tyler, uh, this is a site, and, this, and many of these things, this is loaded with duckweed. It's completely covered with duckweed. This particular sample has um, a, a nitrogen com a component of it's probably, I think it's around three, two and a half to three parts per million. Not much, and the water's coming out of the bedding plane, and we measured across the face of that, and the lower temperatures mean that's where the groundwater comes from. And with that lower temperature, um, uh, I've, I've got students who are willing to get out on their, they're getting down and wallow around and get a, get a meaningful, good sample just like Tyler's done right here. Uh, some of the springs are perched and they're very small. That means they have a very limited area of recharge, but as it moves downstream, it gets back in to the actual groundwater flow consideration. This had very high microbial background. There were a lot of cattle associated with this. So the problems that we're facing are not just identifying pig waste. We've got poultry litter and we've got cattle waste. And one of the divisive or dis diversionary tactics is it's your fault. It's not my fault. It's not, it's, it's your cows that are causing that. Well, we're, hopefully we are going to identify individual bacteria that are unique, specific <coughs> to hogs compared to cattle, to, to others, and hopefully we can do that. Right now, that has not been ascertained, but uh, gives you an example. Uh, big spring here, uh, and this is along uh, left fork of Big Creek, but the water's coming out. Uh, these are elements of features that are important. <coughs> Another component, wells. A well only samples a very point source. It's a localized source. A spring samples water from a much larger area. It integrates that flow and that's why um, when the animal science department is talking about uh, doing some sampling and using wells, my contention is the wells, you got to be lucky to hit a karst, major karst opening with a well. It's, it's the, uh, the probability was neatly assessed by one of the men I used to work with. He said, it's about the same probability as standing back from a map of the U.S., throwing a dart and hitting the Mississippi River. You may be close, you may have some contact, but it's not the major connection. So those are some general ideas. Uh, again, when the, when, the river, when the river flows, it washes debris, mud, it, all kinds of things. So the, the system itself is, is stressed under those conditions. We typically, on the samples we take, uh, we filter those. These get, uh, after they're filtered, some are acidified, some are not acidified. We do that so that we do not, uh, they don't continue to be dissolved. Or, or they give us an accurate measurement, especially of the metals, before we send them down to Joe Nix's lab. Uh, some of the other the students, uh, and you've seen several of the students through here, have been very active, very helpful, and again, this is a spring. Most of the area, these are not easy places to get to. It's generally hot. It's what you can expect if you want to be a hydrogeologist in our <laughs> uh, The laboratory, to show you, uh, this is uh, in Joe's laboratory. It's a high quality lab. It's state approved. And here's some of the results. And I'm only going to show you a little bit. And these numbers are, they're not going to be 
a real meaningful, but for nitrate, NO3, uh, the value of the highest values of nitrate are on the order of uh, five milligrams per liter, five parts per million. That's not very much, but in fact, as you, we go, it already is showing us there is an impact from other human activity in the location. Um, chlorides, chloride values are essential for the most part. Well, they're less than 10 parts per million. Uh, that's a remarkably low number. And calcium, because the rock itself is calcium carbonate or limestone, uh, that's one of the dominant forms. And we usually have somewhere uh, in this range, this is uh, the 10th percentile below which, this is the 90th percentile, 25, 75, and here's 50 percentile. So average values of uh, uh, <coughs> calcium are in, uh, typically in the range of uh, 30, 40 parts per million. And not, I mean, it's, but it's natural. It's good, it's good. If you have heart disease, calcium is generally good. The quality of the water is generally good. Here's one that gives us a very good insight into this E. coli. These are wastes that show that we've, they've been associated with uh, manures and so forth. These could be from uh, septic systems. They could be from any number of places, human, animal, or so forth. And those values, this, this goes up very quickly from zero to 5,000. Uh, typically, most of the numbers are down low right now. But uh, <coughs> fecal coliform is another matter. Fecal coliform, these are indicator organisms that are found in animals and so forth. And we've got a value that goes off to, it goes off 240,000. 240,000, the units are most probable numbers per 100 milliliters. 100 milliliters is about a test tube that's this big, and uh, 240,000 means if you drank that, you would be sicker than a dog. Uh, but it shows a huge range across here that indicates we're not filtering any of this water. It's just naturally occurring. Uh, and so let me finish up. Here, here's another example. Here's where the, this is where most of the data plot. These are the major constituents. It's mostly a calcium bicarbonate water. About 300 to 400 parts per million total dissolved solids. The water that is beneath the uh, older rocks, the shales, uh, which act as an umbrella and shed is shed, uh, has a little more, it's got a little more uh, sodium, a little more potassium, uh, but it's generally a little less dissolved. And then finally, uh, these, this is the highest water quality we found beneath those, uh, beneath those uh, shales, uh, very deep, 1,200 feet. And uh, this gives us a, um, it's about 800 to 900. So what we find then, if we go back to our cross-section, just to show you where we find these samples, here's where we find the Boone water samples, and uh, they're consistent. They don't vary very much. There are small values, and you, you can have some potential contamination within that, within those. Uh, these are up in the Pennsylvania, in the shales, and the sandstones and they haven't reacted with the rock very much, they haven't moved very much, and those are uh, the, about 200, and then these beneath, deeply beneath these, uh, this is, uh, the, these intervals, that's about 1,200 feet deep uh, from the top of, the, of this bluff. So it gives you a general sense of what the water quality is. Now we're going to do some dye tracing. We have been looking for cars uh, considerations, karst inventory, uh, which means find places where there are sinkholes, where there are openings, where there are voids. Here's a sinking creek. This is at our Savoy Experimental Watershed, which actually occurs on the Department of Agriculture land. Uh, and we've established a lot of good working relationships with them. The dye goes in, the dye comes out. 
However, there's a hill between where it goes in and where it comes out. It follows that path of least resistance along a fracture, and it's a series of caves and so forth. The die gives us a point-to-point -point fingerprint that is a very, very good indication. Okay, so those are the costs. Are there, uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about much. Uh, air pollution, yeah, it started. Uh, contamination of rivers, likely because of the karst, that close interaction. We haven't seen it yet, but we've got to be really careful. They haven't start spreading the litter. They've just, they've got the hogs in the operation. Uh, the other questions I didn't answer, and these, um, I'm going to leave those um, for later. So what we have is, uh, here's a synthesis. This is the other take home message. The groundwater and surface water in this setting are tightly controlled, tightly interconnected. And uh, there's water that flows over the surface, that flows into the groundwater, it gets into the river, and it goes, and it go in all dimension, dimensions you can have. Um, like uh, Fox News, if I uh, say everybody lives downstream, but I quit saying that, it goes away. If I say something that is not true, it doesn't mean that it actually isn't there. We need to question those facts. We need to be honest. We need to be candid. Uh, in this particular case, uh, abusive of Fox News, I shan't be any longer. Uh, I'll go to the summary. And the water is moving. It is cycling. It is dynamic. And it's moving through the hydrologic cycle like it always has. Uh, it is, uh, it's reacting with the rocks. And that's what we've seen so far. We've seen a little impact from human, a little impact from other animals, but otherwise not much. Uh, the waters are part of a interrelated resource. And if you live downstream from this feature, you very likely are going to have a major impact of your water quality uh, from this factory farm. Uh, the fact that underground water cannot be observed, we can't see it. It's a sinkhole, it's down. I can't see it moving through the ground. I don't know where it's going to go, where it's going to end up. It's still moving. It's still there. It's still dynamic. And the, the other point I want to make is uh, cleanup costs are absolutely huge. Once you contaminate a site, uh, the things that are most expensive here are the ones that are associated with they're associated with the sediments, things like phosphorus and uh, arsenic and other additives. And it may take decades for these to clean up. Thank you very much for your time. I'm sure there are going to be questions, but I have one thing to say first. Uh, Again, thank you. Um, the van submitted a proposal to the governor um, for $69,000, which was small compared to the uh, program from the Division of Agriculture that the governor is presumably funding for $340,000. That other study, he referred to it in a way they're going to be drilling these wells for monitoring, which are problematic. Um, but they do, do not even mention karst in their proposal. And they don't even have a geologist on their staff. So if this proposal were actually peer-reviewed, like the proposal should be from an educational institution, I would say it would have some problems. But anyway, uh, I hope you will accept this van. We're going to make a donation for supplies, probably less than you've already spent, but the Ozark Society is going to donate for dyes, for supplies, for travel expenses, a check for $4,000. I wanted to get that in before the 